Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our next talk today. We have, uh, before I begin, uh, just so you know, the presentation is recorded. So if just we will use this on the website of technosemiotics.net, and we will also be publishing this on YouTube as well, too. Um, and today we will discuss Jared Smith's research. And Jared is a close friend of mine who I met while he was doing his master's, um, his master's degree in philosophy at Tartu. Uh, recently, he's been in Columbia teaching at a high school, and he is now moving to Virginia Tech to the Science and Technology Studies program with the focus on philosophy of technology. And this is where he's investigating the metaphysical and ontological challenges of current and future developments. So today, it looks like we'll have a sneak peek into what Jared uh, is interested in, in regards to, you know, post-phenomenon and technology itself. So Jared, nice to eventually, well, to once again, talk to you again. Um, you know, it's too bad it's not in the house like the old days, but, you know. I feel like I'm right there right now. I can see the living room. <laughs> yeah, but uh, thanks for the great introduction. But uh, yeah, so I'm Jared, yeah. everybody. So yeah, the floor is yours, and then, you know, after that, we'll go ahead and we'll talk afterwards more about it. Sure, no problem. All right, thank you. Yeah, so today, as Alec was mentioning, this is, I guess you could say, kind of a sneak peek into the research that I'm getting into, specific to technology and the sort of impact that it's having on our metaphysical and ontological understandings. And so today, the title is Know Thyself and Beyond. That is, we've always had some desire to know who we are, and now perhaps we can go even further with it, with technological developments. So the focus of the presentation itself is going to be a post-phenomenological analysis of a potential trajectory of AI and technology. Post-phenomenology is a style of philosophy of technology that looks at very pragmatic roots of understanding the relations between a human user and technology and the desired output of the object. And through this analysis, I'm going to try and pick out some of the metaphysical or ontological uh, understandings that we might gather from the way in which AI could and is right now being used in the way of understanding. That is an understanding of people, an understanding of their actions, their behaviors, their values, and these sorts of things. So the real quick breakdown of what this presentation is gonna do is first introduce what is actually being discussed here. What is the deeper issue that uh, it, this is getting to the core at? After that, uh, I need to introduce to you what is an understanding AI as what I'm calling it as a simplified means here and its connection to a philosophy of technology that has been gaining a lot of ground within the past 20 or 30 years known as transhumanism. So I'm gonna give you some definitions, some examples, and then connect those two to show you why I am calling this kind of AI potentially transhuman. And finally, after that, I will conduct my post phenomenological analysis to reveal the sort of potential route this is taking and the actual impact that it is having on uh, an ontological and metaphysical understanding. So the issue that's at stake here is our metaphysical and ontological understanding, the what and the why of what I'm seeing when it comes to my life, our lives. Now, before the enlightenment, before you know, we started going with human reason, God, for much of the Western world, stood as this metaphysical and ontological understanding. Why are the things the way that they are? Because God wills it. Why am I the way that I am? Because that's how God designed it. That was the prevailing belief in Western society for hundreds of years. Uh, in fact, it was such a prevalent thing that there are quite a few philosophers of metaphysics that argue that it was near impossible to be an atheist back then because the metaphysical hegemony of God was just so strong back then. That was until the Enlightenment, the modern era, modernity, as we call it in philosophy with humanism, 
And in a very simplified sense, humanism is a huge term here for the sake of this. Humanism, as I'm describing it here, is that discrete rational self. We began to see ourselves as individuals capable of human reason, and it is through this human reason that we may make sense of our surroundings and ourselves, that metaphysics and the ontology. And through this, we created a dualist ontology. Uh, it was stemming still from religion, but this idea that there is a subject, I, and an object, something else. I separated myself, as it were, from my surroundings. And now we're in the postmodern era. And humanism has had its course. Humanism, uh, with its dualist ontology, has created some difficulties in our own understanding, and perhaps it's holding us back in some regards. And so there's a question on what's next. What will be that core thing that collectively drives us forward in our understandings of ourselves, of each other, of the potential future? And so this question is, is it technology? Is technology going to be, in a sense, the new God? And through this, transhumanism stands as the apex of this idea that technology can become the next uh, core thing that holds us all together, which is why I've chosen it as the focus. So let me explain what I mean by this. So first is transhumanism. Again, in a more simplified sense, transhumanism is the use of technologies to push human capabilities past what we already possess. So some examples of this kind of technology are life extension technologies. Technologies in biomedicine that could make us live to 150, maybe even 200 years. Uh, mind upload, uh, taking our brains and uploading it into a computer so we may live longer. Uh, capable of super intelligence, super well-being in which we're never actually going to be you know, suffering emotionally or mentally again. Uh, some of the ideas of transhumanism are ones that don't exist yet, and yet some of them very much do exist. These life extension technologies are something that is gaining more money and more uh, attention in the scientific community uh, every year. And so transhumanism stands as this philosophy of where should we take our technology? Where should we take ourselves? Should we not, in a sense, push ourselves, transcend our own human humanity to become something more. And I'm going to connect this with this, what I'm calling understanding AI, which is just a type of artificial intelligence that we've designed and used to help an individual or a collective into understanding themselves. And through this understanding, advise some sort of future action or state of being. Now, an example, or getting more into depth with this understanding AI, is that there currently are a few versions of this AI that's used to understand us, both in a psychological and a neuroscientific way. Uh, the psychological ones and even neuroscientific ones are more data-driven. So these are the kinds that you might see with Google or uh, like political uh, gatherings of information, which helps people understand opinions, values, and preferences. And then there's also brain scanning ones in which it's a quite literally attaching itself to seeing the neural pathways in humans. And the, this can be used as a prediction of behavior, emotions, or even divergent attitudes or divergent states of mental states. Uh, and you know, these are, again, very much in use right now. In fact, uh, I use this book here as the example, because it's the one that kind of started this off for me, is there is an AI that can be used to read ones like uh, social media activity, and in, you know, after reading about 20 posts or so, it can make a conclusion about various sets of ideas and values and opinions of this person that, you know, in five posts, they would know better than their friends. In 10 posts, they could know better than their close friends. In 15 or 20, they could know better than their partners or even their family members. And so this begs the question, is there not a certain point where maybe this thing could actually understand you more than you already understand yourselves? As much as we like to think we know ourselves pretty well, we're typically blind to certain other things. Now, why am I bringing this up is that, well, an AI is, it's an algorithm, right? It's reading an input and it's giving an output based off of the parameters and the framework that was provided to it. And in this book, Homo Deus, uh, the writer, uh, Harari, he makes the argument that the human mind works pretty similarly. That is, we operate algorithmically when it comes to our state of consciousness and being. 
Our brains are working in this input output based off parameters, what we've come to understand, and we produce a certain output. And because of this, it is possible, they argue, that this kind of AI, this kind of understanding AI, could quite literally tap into and flow with the kind of human consciousness. And so it begs the question of whether, you know, how far is this thing going to go? Is it just something uh, interesting, but also kind of creepy when Google can predict what you want to buy? Or is this something that is actually going to be able to get at you on a very individualized basis and, yeah, help you understand who you are? And of course, there's a few different directions that that use can go. Now, what's the connection here? Well, transhumanism desires to create and implement technology that allows us to transcend those current limitations we all have as human beings. And one of these limitations could be this lack of self-understanding and knowledge, which causes us to repeat those same mistakes or habits we all do as human beings. And because of this, you know, we have a reduction in our well-being and perhaps even our longevity. Understanding AI could help us understand and through this potentially help our own well-being, our own way of understanding and behaving in the way that perhaps we would like to. And because of this, I would consider it a potential tra trajectory of this transhuman technology. It gives us the new insight into what, who we are and what we can do. So that was the connection there between AI and transhuman. Now, for the real analysis to be done through post-phenomenology. Post-phenomenology's most core uh, aspect of it is something called technological mediation, a way of understanding the phenomena that is occurring when a piece of technology is being used. And to simplify it down, um, technological mediation is between the subject, the technology, and the object. That is, the technology is playing a mediative role between these two different aspects. And the more important thing to bring up now, because it will come up important later, is that the focus of post phenomenology is not necessarily on the subject or object, especially not initially, it's on the technology. Because without the technology, the subject and object would not exist in this equation. So the core focus, especially initially, is that technology. And from that, what arises is in revealed through that, that is, the subject, the user, and the object, the desire that is being done. Let me give you just a couple examples to help uh, visualize this a bit better. The two uh, examples I'll give you here are the embodiment and hermeneutic relation. An embodied relation is where the technology becomes you know, close, quite literally, but also you know, metaphysically, close to the human user and allows them to then perceive the object as something different. And the classic example for this one are glasses. That is me and glasses become part of, in a sense of one another, but remaining separate. And through this, I am literally able to perceive the object, the world differently. The hermeneutic relation puts technology on the other side of the equation. This is where the human is very much distinct away from it and the technology and object kind of mesh together in a way. In this case, I would say the wristwatch is a good example. That is the wristwatch is reading for me something about the world. In this case, the time, the day, maybe the temperature. And so these two kinds of relations differ in the ways in which the subject and the object are even created within the equation, but also how they are being engaged with differently here. Now I bring this up because I would consider the AI that transhumanism would probably go towards, my informed prediction would be using it as that hermeneutic relation. That is, you have on the left side, the subject side, I, and on the right side, the object side is the AI and me, me as the object, that person that I'm viewing. And so what this does is this understanding AI mediates a kind of solidified self-understanding. That is, it takes a capture, a snapshot, screen cap of this one singular moment of who you are, who you'd want to be, and you read it as if it's off of a wristwatch or 
just some sort of information being given to you by some sort of separate entity, this technology. And so it creates this objectified view of ourselves and the tech remains something separate. It remains separate from me, the user, but also me, the, or rather I, the user, and me, the object being viewed. Now, to go even further in this, within every mediation, there are dimensions. There are different ways that it is influencing us, be this the epistemic, the practical, or in the case of this presentation and this analysis, the ontological. Every mediation, according to post-feminology, is paradoxical. It has two sides to the mediation. And on the case of the ontological, the two sides are revealing and concealing. That is when we mediate, when the technology mediates some sort of thing for us, some sort of action or phenomena, it reveals something to us. But at the same time, every time it reveals something, it conceals something else. Our brains can really only interpret so much at once. And so when it's revealing one thing, the other things kind of go to the back of our minds. We forget about them, they're concealed. And so understanding this relation and understanding this dimension helps us understand the kind of impact it will have. So I would argue, my own prediction is, what is revealed through this understanding AI is that objectified snapshot of the user that we can then use to advise some sort of future action. It's revealed to us, hey, this is a possibility that I can take something that perhaps I want, or I've been told that I want, I use the AI, it provides me some sort of output, and I can now use this to change how I am and what I do. And it also reveals to us that this AI is this separate tool that we can use to interpret and aid us in our human experience, essentially. But the concealed is obviously where things get a little bit more interesting. Uh, I would argue that what is concealed here are other modes of revealing, right? If one thing is being proposed and used as the way to be, it reduces, it conceals, it hides away other ways of being. That's always kind of been the case. It also conceals, I would argue, the nature of the subject and object distinction. That is, I am my, the object of my mediation is me. And yet through this, it conceals the fact that perhaps who I'm looking at is actually still me. It's just that, again, solidified singular moment of me. That is, the object perhaps has already been created prior to me even using this AI, right? We already have our prior understanding as perhaps of who we'd like to be, what we'd like to change. And so in this sense, the AI could become biased in the way that it looks at it, or we or our perceptions through the AI can be biased. And then it solidifies that bias and that can be you know, pro and con. And then finally, simply it's replacing God. That is, who am I? What am I doing? Well, those are the answers that, quite, that God had. Those are the answers that human reason supposedly had. And now perhaps it's just the reasons that technology has. That is, we're not really fixing the problem so much. We're just putting in something else to fill the gap. In this case, artificial intelligence. Uh, the last thing that I would say is, is there an alternative to this? That is, I think it's quite clear to everybody that artificial intelligence and these technologies are only going to become faster, stronger, more uh, within every fabric of our society because they're just so powerful, they're so useful. And so what is the way in which perhaps we can make a different trajectory? Can we use this understanding AI in a way that is one that is more beneficial to us than a threat to us? One that the revealing concealing nature is probably not as problematic. I would argue that the philosophy of posthumanism perhaps has this idea. What is posthumanism? Posthumanism is essentially a philosophy in which we do away with humanism. That is those dualistic ontologies, you know, uh, subject, object, human, technology, man, woman, all of these distinctions that we've created are the thing holding us back. And so we should create and do things that shatter those boundaries. And so I would argue that the post-human way of doing this understanding or even knowing AI is what's called a cyborg relation, very much in line with what we think of with the word cyborg. But in this case, it would not necessarily be a literal fusion of 
this AI in our brains or something, but rather the overlap and fusion of what we want. The user and the technology, in this case, we become one. We don't have this duality. It's not, oh, this is me and this is what the AI says. It is, we are coming together as one. And through this, we cultivate an understanding and an acting that is stemming from just one person, this cyborg, this post human. The subject and object, in this case, it, it becomes a blur. Since I am looking at the object, me, of what I want to understand, it's something active. Since I am in this cybernetic relationship, what I am viewing is something active and coming back to me. And so it's this constant cycling forward. Who is the object? Who is the subject in this is not nearly as important. It's not the focus of it as much. It is just this entity itself in its active state. Uh, so yeah, I would argue that is a potential alternative to this trajectory that avoids some of the issues of transhumanism. And yeah, and my references are here, a few of them. So, yeah, thank you for listening. Yes, thank you for the presentation. That was nice. Um, I have a few questions philosophical questions um that so i'll yeah we'll 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 talk philosophically for a little bit and then i have a couple like semiotic related questions um so like one of the one of the things i'm curious about like from from your perspective how does ai fit into this aspect of history repeating itself so if this if AI is this revolutionary technology that you know we've never seen before in society, um, how does it fit into the narrative of cyclical time? Hmm. I suppose there's a couple of ways to go about that question. The one that I immediately caught my attention was the fact that, you know, again, we, we try to view AI as some sort of you know entirely new amazing entity that we've never seen before but in reality it is just us right it's our we program it we make it because it's something that we want you know it, it is in the case that it is circular it is because it is our own invention our own creation and so it is bound to become circular itself and repeating the sign kinds of things that we want uh you know for instance i guess you could say like a circular thing is the the struggle politics that you know that we're always afraid of the political realm and the social realm being oppressed in some way and we think ai could be the thing that breaks that but depending on who has the keys to the machine ai can just create the exact same problem just with a new face does that answer your question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now I, I can see it being used as a as a tool to like repeat time as well too exactly yeah yeah um and about like technology be becoming the next god um or being the next god is it like one specific type of technology or is it used in the sense of like love you know how you know many many objects can represent love mm -hmm. uh so when you when you mean like technology is the new god uh, what specifically, like as an object, um, does it relate to? So I would say in this case, how technology relates to this idea of God is perhaps the desire of transhumanism here. As I, I picked this out since I, I recognize it as the top example of this idea as technology as God is that it is that wanting of transcendence, of being perhaps unhappy or unsatisfied with the current situation, status quo, and using technology, letting it guide us, but also designing it in a sense for us as well, in a way that is able to push us somewhere else. So it's having faith. I would say that's the thing, is we have the people who follow transhumanism, who want life extension, who want super intelligence, super well-being, they have faith, they want, technology to be the answer to these problems in that sense so they are throwing in their lot with that <clears throat> okay yeah i get what you mean uh it's it sounds similar to what i kind of made like 
uh, explicit in my recent paper about how like from like especially for like virtual reality or any sort of like immersive experience uh, within hyper reality how designers should be pushing towards like higher needs of like physiological needs rather than driving towards the the lower driven needs for instance um you know worrying about what virtual clothes to wear or what happens to my virtual house you know you could say that these are lower needs but learning a new skill for instance such as language acquisition this is a higher need um mm -hmm. so you know it's one of those things that from the designer's standpoint how do you educate them on like the the not only the urgency but the need to in incorporate like higher needs but how do you also um teach the user that this is kind of how you transcend yourself exactly i think that's a very good point in that a lot of transhuman technologies don't necessarily teach they just do i obviously anytime we use right as the mediation saw it is teaching us something but there is less a focus on trying to cultivate a agency within the user and more or less just producing this output, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the case, again, with like the reason why I argue for perhaps this more post-human take on artificial intelligence is because I would, I would think the transhuman way of using this understanding AI is one which kind of neglects the, the actual metaphysical necessity of us trying to understand who we are and rather just allowing something else to do it for us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And what about when it comes to the actual user itself, uh, what sort of distinctions do you see when they're like a, a digital native, you know, that grew up in technology versus someone like our age, you know, who kind of grew alongside of the development of technology? I would say the younger people, the ones who definitely grew up with smartphones in their hands since they're 10 plus years old. I think this idea of the, the cybernetic relationship in the, in the case of agency is one which is incredibly comfortable for them. Uh, you know, I can even think of the fact that, you know, I'm sitting here teaching high school and Every single one of my students, their phones are attached at the hip. And we make that as a joke, you know, like it's the boomer joke of, oh, these young people are in their phones. But honestly, it's it's such a it's the norm, right? It is the powerful tool that we all have in our pockets. And for some of us, like you say, that grew up with it later on in life, it seems different to us only because it wasn't there necessarily present with us in the beginning. But it is, I think, something that is much more comfortable with people who have already grown up with it. This idea of a, a blending in of your agency. Okay. And in regards to agency, because that, that definitely is a big aspect when it comes to just reality in general, right? Sure. Knowing, and even when it comes to choice, you know, you have to have this agency in order to uh, act upon choice for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to AI, um, does AI have its own environment, would you say? Like, what is what the environment? Mean? Like, what is the environment for AI? Like, what is the, the, yeah, the environment, the surrounding that allows AI to come into our desires? You mean like that? Yeah, because like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to not put it strictly into semiotics, like yet, in a way. Sure. Um, but like, you know, if, you know, as, as a user, we interact within an environment. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where like the meaning is emerging within the environment. But when AI does something, has some sort of output, um, do, does it actually understand that it is going into an environment? Or how does it, you know, because sure, it has neural networks and it has these different pathways that kind of get, you know, um, you know, crystallized over time. Mm -hmm. uh, for certain things, but when it comes to environment, uh, do you think this fits into the, like this, because in a way, what I'm trying to get to is like, you know, you, you show the two different aspects of, you know, the hermeneutic aspect, which that's how you say relates to it. Uh, but even then AI is used to 
in a way, teach us some or show us something about the environment, like the objective aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's one of those things that like, sure, if if AI itself doesn't truly have this like subjectivity, um, whether it's because of embodied not having embodied cognition or uh, being able to grow out of itself, uh, but what does the like does the environment need to even know what an environment or does AI need to even know what an environment is for that matter? I think it would be beneficial to its work to understand the kind of job that it's doing, at least in what we have right now, which is a very simple sense of AI, one that is still very much in its infancy, mm-hmm. but it is one that I think. You know, again, that the way that we want AI to work is one that we want to be able to understand what it's producing for us. And for us to understand what that means, it has to kind of, in a sense, talk to us in a way that we understand. And so if we want to understand this object, this environment, and what we can then do about it, right, which I would argue is the the, the best way to explain agency or even freedom of choice, all this is how you relate to your environment, how you, the subject, relate to the object, if we want to go dualistic there, right? And so the AI, I would argue, if we want it to actually be effective in this job, it needs to understand that it is that mediating between me and that environment. And so, yes, I think it would need to know the environment, but then you also ask, is it a part of the environment? And that is a question I don't, think I can answer right now. I think that's one I would need to <laughs> seriously think about. Yeah, I, I could see it going both ways. I think, think it could be part of the environment or in a very meta sense, it is the environment, you know? Yeah, because it is one of those things that like, you know, kind of relaying it back to my research mm-hmm. about how, you know, I'm, I'm modeling how the user uh, co-develops in the digital environment that they're within. Um, and even in this this hyper real environment, whether it's VR, for instance, it still relies on like my physical environment, you know, so it's this, it relates back to like this, this modeling of both ends, which, you know, it, for me, it relates to transmodernism. Um, so, you know, for me, I don't use transhumanism as this going beyond the, the postmodern bubble, uh, mm-hmm. per se, uh, because it does seem like in order for us to to understand the how we co-develop in this this new day and age, um, we have to take into consideration the physical environment, but also this virtual environment that you know it's not physically here, but yet it still relies on agency in both of them, um, especially when you're immersed. Um, and they obviously both have an impact on yeah. us in every way, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's one of those things that, you know, sure, when it comes to adaptation, sure, humans can do that naturally. But when it comes to AI, you know, how much how much age agency in their system is like, you know, this this changing of contextualization actually built into it, uh, because sure, something may work for one user, but that's not guaranteed for someone else. Yeah, of course, it would really depend on how it is we're creating and setting it up yeah. of course yeah. yeah which is why i would argue again like another way to point it out is the the transhuman way of going about it which you say they're transcending uh, modernity and on the surface that's what it is but honestly you look at it and it's just it's modernity again just in a different way of saying it uh, yeah. and i would argue that this sense this this way of creating it if we take this philosophical initial position and try to create this AI, it'll be, as you were saying there, it almost trying to be one size fits all, but maybe not because it's it's on the other side of the equation. Whereas if we were to try to create an AI that takes into account that, it is one that could potentially be one that is adapting and molding to the individual itself since it's becoming part of them, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because then, as as my last question before we open it up to you know everyone else, um, I'm I'm curious how this post-human aspect relates to like the the first hermetic law of how everything is mental, you know how the the universe is mind. Um, mm-hmm. So when it comes to this and this relation of subject and object, um, 
it seems like something external is being brought into this equation. Um, so would you say that this, this post-human knowing AI, does that still fit into this everything is mental aspect? What do you mean exactly with everything is mental? So when it comes to everything is mental, or other words, the universe is mind, that means um, pretty much I'm trying to not keep it in. I'm trying to avoid semiotics uh, for this um, ex expression. Um, but pretty much it's it starts with being aware of what something represents. And once you understand that, okay, this this television remote, right? Um, it comes from something else and wow. so, on and so on. So it relates to this infinite aspect of meaning. Uh, and even then it it relates to objects because you know these objects are what's in the minds uh, and things are what's in our environment. So mm -hmm. hearing the, the sound of a car, for instance, this is just a thing, uh, but knowing what it represents to me and how I change my behavior around that, it then becomes an object within the minds. So when it comes to everything is mental, um, you know, it is one of those things that humans did create AI, but when we start seeing AI as its own entity, like mm -hmm. outside the reach of humans, um, mm -hmm. it's, to me, it's kind of, it's interesting to think um, if, the, if, if this fits into, you know, everything is mental because this would kind of imply that, you know, AI has a mind of its own, you know, if, if you go that way. So, I mean, it also sounds like philosophical terms, you know, everything is just perception, right? Yeah. Everything is the way that it is because I see it, I hear it. And then as you say, there are ideas attached to that. There is phenomena that we attach to those perceptions. And that is sort of the basis of our understanding of anything and everything. So in this case, yes, uh, I would say that it is that post-humanism, especially the post-humanist way of doing AI, is an extension of this. It's almost a, uh, you know, a, a, a doubling down on the fact that, hey, you know, me as the subject, of course, I'm hearing that, I'm seeing that, but that thing itself is mm -hmm. incurring its own agency onto me. And so I'm not actually like the rational, completely self absorbed subject that humanism thinks I am. I am one that is based on their environment, right? And so post-humanism in a sense, you know, says, yes, that's exactly what we are, that we need to acknowledge the fact that we are much more of a collective rather than an individual sense of existence. And even as you say that, that AI can go beyond the reach of humanity, well, what does that even reach me, right? Like, why do we even imagine it as the human reach of things and not just something else, right? Mm -hmm. Like an animal, it's just mm -hmm. something else there. Yeah. Nice, okay. So uh, before we have start like asking other people to uh, turn on their mic microphone, there's a question in the chat uh, that you should be able to see. Oh yeah, let me take a look here. Uh, okay. Which writers do you recommend who make arguments that human thought is like AI processing? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Alexander. I mean, that's a very good question that, yeah, there's a lot of hype out there about what AI is or is not capable of. Uh, and so, like, if you want, like, the actual academic neuroscience, psychological stuff, I would be unable to help you there. I think a great way to start, at least in this regard, would maybe be this Homo Deus Harari. Uh, you know, he goes with a bit of a, a, a popular open-ended, you know, uh, take on it, but through reading it, he also references a lot of authors that maybe then you could jump into more if you wanted more depth into that. I would say that would be how I can help you with that question. <laughs> I have one question from the audience. Hey, thanks. Um, this is Josh. Uh, yeah, that was nice. Um, 
uh, your framings were really clear and, um, it, you know, it outlines, um, I especially liked how you juxtapose transhuman and post, uh, post humanism. Um, I guess, I guess I'll take a, take a shot at transhumanism. I have some, some pretty substance, you know, substantial critiques of, um, uh, transhumanism essentially being uh, a millennial long uh, endeavor to, you know, for everlasting life and the final answer, the final algorithm as it would be considered now, but, you know, it's, it's had different names throughout the millennia, but it's basically the same human uh, fetishization of utopia. Um, and, you know, I, I lived I, from California, I'm from San Francisco, I'll never forget going to, you know, when I was first getting into AI in 2000, early 2000s, I went to a transhumanist lecture on AI and um, at San Francisco, and the the cultish feeling like was palpable. Um, and, and I don't say that to be pejorative, actually, I, I say that just as an actual attribute of a certain mindset of, of countless humans over, you know, you know, innumerable generations of what I call the cybernetic mode. But I mean, we could ground in 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 uh, folks like um, uh, Lewis Mumford's Myth of the Machine, uh, mm -hmm. I think is really relevant to this discussion. Uh, his main thesis of, of that series of books is essentially that humans, our problem is, is that, uh, uh, is that we overproduce signs, we overproduce, we're just overproductive. Uh, it's not a problem of scarcity. It's a problem of overproduction, and that, that throughout the centuries, we essentially come up with institutions that try and ameliorate essentially which the human the human condition, um, and that AI uh, is just an extension of that overproduction um, without a commensurate balance in um, in resolving the the dilemma you know the dilemmas. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I definitely, I take, I definitely would disagree with Harari on a number of levels, but in particular, comparing AI, to, you know, the way it thinks to the way we think, uh, even though we do have an overproduction, uh, you know, problem in terms of um, our reflexivity, and that we're constantly trying to manage it. Um, I think that equating sort of equate, I think that the solution is in the problem. In other words, it, it is in us. Um, that's why I liked your, your post, you know, your post human turn, I think is a nice turn, especially if we look at folks like Donna Haraway. Um, mm -hmm. I think that she's really helpful in, in having us so-called stay with the trouble. <laughs> right, yeah. Don't there, don't get away from this. Stay with it, but yeah. technology could help us, right? Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I'm not, yeah, I, I know it sounds like I was just like, I'm a Luddite, but actually it's quite the opposite. <laughs> no, no. I, I think that, I think you rightly, you nicely problematized, or at least were honest about like the confusion, subject object confusion that, per, you know, pervaded, you, you was, went through your entire talk. And I think that confusion is very appropriate and it's just where we are and in, in, in reckoning with our own our own duality um but the Donna Haraway in staying with the trouble is in essence trying to um trying to uh you know that we just aren't even there yet and that that my suggestion would be that AI is just one one in a long, long, long step of technologies that are dead on arrival, and that we just haven't we haven't even really we haven't even really understood how it is. Well, let alone the human animal, but any animal on the planet re resolves the onslaught of uh, stimulation that we all feel and that that we're all sensitive to, and that we have to resolve in real time. For, with existential implications. And so, yeah, so I, humans, humans created technology as an extension of our subjectivity. So I think in that sense, I would agree with, with you, um, or at least an aspect of some of your characterizations were nice, um, but that we still have a long way to go. And that these, these equivocations between the human mind and this externalization of what, these abstractions of what we think the mind is doing in our machines is is only just is only just uh, prolonging the problem, I guess. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? that's quite a lot? <laughs> oh, I mean, it was a lot there, and I uh, thank you for that. That was awesome. Yeah, and to start off, 
the the argument that I made there with the human mind and the algorithmic, uh, you know, I, that was definitely my weakest part of the argument. It was something that I read and I was like, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I would like to read more up on that, but yeah. I could definitely see what you're putting down there now. And it sounds like sort of the, the point that you're making there at the end was that we, as you say, we're prolonging the issue because we're still trying to imagine the AI as like us in a way. Was that kind of what you're yeah, alluding it, to? It's a it's a fantasy. It's like a projection. We're projecting onto um, onto the world what we want, what we desperately want to be, which is, uh, as Lewis Mumford argued in, in his um, myth of the machine, is that we tell ourselves this myth. We tell ourselves this story. We generate these narratives, you know, you know, century after century to essentially ameliorate the, the trauma of being self-reflexive. Uh. Okay. So you're saying that AI is just that ne the new example of how it's we're just doing. the it's just the next way that we sort of entertain ourselves uh, with our cleverness and uh, to sort of you know medicate almost in a way to to, to maybe be a little flip about it, but um, that it, yes, in a very real way, it's um, uh, it's it's uh, it, it's trying to realize that myth of control, and mm -hmm. in a way it just like capitalism and all that kind of stuff, like our religion or, uh, or monarchies or feudalism, they're all, they're all institutions that actually do partially solve the problem of our over hyperactive mental capacities, mm -hmm. but at a great cost. And arguably at this point, it's pretty, the, I think the jury's in, it's not sustainable. <clears throat> So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've got to, we've got to really, I think at this point, dig deep and really, really commits to what it is uh, is really happening not not just in the human mind although that certainly mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. but also the relationship um, back to Alex's question of the environment you know the mm -hmm. the relationship between uh, between ourselves and and the only known biosphere I mean I could rattle off I mean to the question in the comments it, um, oh well it was that was Tori. <laughs> <laughs> to Tori's question, um, well, she would know all the things that I would recommend, so I, I won't, yeah, torture anyone with like references to Purse and Simon Don. But uh, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much. Sure, sure, thank you. Okay, so I wanted to ask uh, Victoria if she would like to comment more on her question and Jared's reply before. So I can see your camera is on, but it's foggy right now. Hi, sorry, I'm right in the middle of something and I'm trying to watch this at the same time. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, I was going to comment to follow up on the Harari. I, I, I've read, I, I wrote a critique of Harari's positions and um, I come at it as I, I study the notion of intentionality and free will. And, you know, he says humans are hackable animals. Uh, I wrote a piece on Substack, um, which I linked to, uh, but I think maybe I only uh, private message that maybe you could I, copy I will, it. I will share it to everyone here. Right? Yeah, so so with complex system science and chaos theory, we started to think differently about the notion of free will because the 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 strict material deterministic universe of the Enlightenment period had to be revised, you know, and I find that Harari is still kind of stuck in that enlightenment period critiquing the religious view, you know, like the, um, you, you know, what, what he, what he interprets as a religious view, actually, the <clears throat> medieval scholars that I've read on intentionality, like Thomas Aquinas and, and Augustine had very complex notions of, of free will. Um, you, you know, not this, you know, like cartoon version that Harari. So, so I critique that, and and I, and I argue that humans do have free will. <laughs> so, no, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, he's definitely a lot to critique, definitely, and I'm actually looking forward to reading uh, what was linked there. So, thank you for that. 
uh, yeah, I, free will, as it's known right now, especially within like post phenomenology, which is what I study, is like, yes, we're free agents, but it is something entirely dependent on the environment for us to be able to implore such agency or free will over, which I think is kind of going into what Alec was also alluding to with the environment. So yeah, it's it's a yes, but kind of thing. The infamous philosophical answer. Yeah, to even follow up with that, I mean, how do you think like free will even fits into this narrative? You know, when it comes to being able to read the environment, to read, well, to be, to more or less be given meaning for that matter um, from AI, um, where where does like free will uh, play into it when it comes to being immersed with this technology? Because um, sure, you could have the free will of not using it if you do use it, but like. If you if you are this transhuman, um, what what's the the negation associated to it? So as it was kind of getting at, like it's a good example with that uh, cyborg sense of things, but with the transhuman, any sort of technological mediation with its own self, the technology itself is in a not in the exact same way, but it is imploring its own agency towards you. What it's showing you, what it's allowing you to do is kind of begging you in a sense to use it, it's sort of relating to that environment, our perception we see, we have the idea, we know. It's now exacting some of that over us. And so then the agency is us realizing, is this something that I want or need to use in this certain context? Is it something that is going to yield something in this way. And so I would say in the case of agency with this transhuman is, is they are allowing it to enact that sort of agency over themselves while also taking it up themselves. So it's a composite, a blending in of these two, but not fully, not as much as I would say the post-human version, which is quite literally a fusion. You can't tell the difference between the human or the AI as agency. But in the transhuman way, the agencies are, you can more easily separate the two. And when it comes to like designers of AI, how, I mean, sure they have their own sort of structure on, you know, these philosophical arguments that they create. Um, but how do you actually, how do you see transhumanism helping their business? Like, you know, what's, what's the, as a philosopher or someone else in academia, how can it be applied to like, you know, the industry sector? So I would say in this case, the thing with uh, transhumanism as was mentioned earlier is it's kind of cultish. It's a, pretty much a religion, uh, like the way that they think, the way that they desire, the way that they try to enact things, it's quite similar to that. And so I would say, at least for the transhumanism aspect, the way that they could appeal to the business sector is in saying, hey, we have, we know human beings want these certain like uh, fantasized utopian styles of, of being that we want all these things taken care of for us and we can just kind of step back. And so transhumanism can appeal to the business sector and basically saying, hey, this is what people want. And so allow us to help you create this connection between the people's wants in your technology. But that's also something that uh, philosophy in a grander sense, even post-phenomenology. Post-phenomenology was founded as a style of philosophy for this exact thing, but not as uh, end gamey with what it wants. It's more just the, the functionality, the frameworks that can work with it, which is how I used it for the transhumanism, say. And even, even with that, um, like one of the questions I, I get kind of asked about at conferences, um, especially with like digital environments, um, is about identity. You know, when it comes to our understanding on what is identity. So when it comes to like the transhuman self, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not really expecting a definitive answer on how we can model what is identity uh, as a, a transhuman identity. But 
what sort of like what barriers do you see when it comes to being able to model like what is identity in this you know in sort of transhuman age because it's one of those things you know it's it it's no longer just body in a way for that matter you know the, the physical body you know it kind of brings into the equation um avatars or you know other sort of um representations of the self so you know how how does that fit into where we should be looking at you know as researchers in the future that's a great question thank you i think on the question of identity for transhumanism it will continue the humanistic trend of dualistic ontology that we will still view things as some sort of separate entity you said this digital self and the real life sets, right? Like IRL, we have created already this distinction between our online and our offline sense of being, of identity. And I think transhumanism is just a good example of this will become the case as well. That is, we will just create more categories and more distinctions to be made between, rather than dealing with that core issue of the very creation of these two different things. So in the terms of identity, transhumanism is just going to repeat the same mistakes, just in a more technological way. Nice, thank you for that ex explanation. Much, much simpler than I would uh, put it. <laughs> yes, um, if anyone have, else has questions. Yeah, I have I'll, a question also, yeah. or maybe several, but I'll start with one. Like I found uh, sort of your approach uh, so the post-humanism part, I suppose it's like an interesting uh, balance between technological determinism and social constructionism uh, in a way that, uh, so what I'm worried about mostly regarding AI in my research is that how um, the ways we describe, analyze and model it right now, uh, these ways um, sort of hide a lot or conceal a lot uh, the existing human functions within those systems you know because it's like it's a complex it's a complex techno-social system like any instance of AI that sort of can exist as a result of of many people actors working together and processing data or or some resources in certain manners and and the way we approach this in media completely conceals the, any role and any agency of these people. And, and this has been found, uh, it's constantly found to be like a huge problem. At the same time, tech companies are not really interested in, in dealing with this always. So like, what do you think uh, can post-human approach to to AI or like this self, like how how does this play into like can it make people more visible somehow by like overcoming this dualism or or like what is the do you have any ideas how you said to make them more visible? What exactly do you mean by that in relation to what you're saying before? I didn't quite connect those two. I mean mostly in. Uh, I mean, basically that like in our current understanding or like uh, this colloquial understanding of AI, where we very often speak about these things as if there were they were entities, you know, sort of like singular entities anthropomorphized or something like that. So it just, uh, which in a sense is easy to do because they are so complex that it's very difficult to, to, describe or reveal or like what it's exactly what's the ontology of this thing how it works and a lot of those details are probably boring to people so I kind of understand how you know we can get from like uh, several years of hard work to the sentence that uh, chat GPT does a lot of stuff better than you <laughs> but um so, I mean, I'm looking for sort of like these models that would help um, make visible those people again in these assemblages, basically. 
you know, uh, sort of like recognize that they exist, recognize what kind of work they do and what kind of and how this work can be, I don't know, modeled via, I don't know, some, some, some like some better models than the anthropomorphic AI, I suppose. Okay, so it's more, I mean, no, I'm just wondering. So I okay. think like this anthropomorphic AI may, maybe plays a lot into like uh, what you described as transhuman mm -hmm. approach to AI, and then the posthuman approach. Sort of like uh, I got this feeling that your approach uh, sort of still. I mean, it's it, it, it still accounts for the human inside. You know, the I, the self, is still human. It's not like uh, the machine or anything else. It's not externalized. Mm -hmm. It's just. Um, and it accepts that we use those technologies to to maybe sometimes build models to better understand ourselves or mm -hmm. to play with our understanding of ourselves. Um, so I think that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I think it does. It maintains that self, as you're saying, but it also introduces and acknowledges that complexity that perhaps some people don't want to engage with, as you say, with AI, oh, it's just simply like this one thing. It's like, no, it's an entire system built on another system, built on another, right? Like it's this, it is a very complex thing, as you say. And I think by doing this, it sort of at least not forces, but definitely affords people the understanding that things are much more complex than they think. And that's probably in a very grand scheme of the entire world, I think that's a very beneficial thing that everyone at least acknowledges. Ah, this stuff's a little bit more complex than those oversimplifications we are so easily drawn to, right? So I would say in that case, yes, it makes things more visible because it makes us try to at least understand and nudges us towards the understanding of, ah, there's a little bit more depth here than I thought initially. Hopefully that helps you answer the question. Okay, but do you see any sort of like policy implications for this? Like can philosophy, I don't know, help? Um, yeah, I don't know, redefine policies regarding, regarding AI or like how we... That is gonna definitely be, I think a big question in the next five, 10, 15 years is like, yeah, exactly what policy is necessary in order for this to be a thing. And I think at a certain point, if we ever do reach a some sort of conclusive understanding that perhaps this AI is something that we might consider alive, using that word very, very vaguely here, I would think it would be necessary for philosophy to come in and say, as a policy, like that is a living thing, if that makes sense. Maybe not a thing, because as we were mentioning, it's quite a multitude, but that it, it the designation that can be given to AI is one that would allow for a little bit more of that open-ended way of seeing things. So in this case, yeah, if that AI is something in a very uh, plural sense, then now we understand it a bit better. It's more clear in our own ontology. Hopefully that gives you a... Sorry, but your question is very difficult. <laughs> doesn't uh, envisioning AI as something potentially alive I mean, this is much more anthropomorphic than we already are, and it completely denies the existence of any humans within its work. Oh, well, then you could just say that it is a creation through that. I see now where you're getting at there. By something, I just meant not necessarily alive in the sense of the human, which is what I was trying to say it in that very generalized sense. But I can still fall victim to that, which I understand what you're getting at there, uh, but that it would still be an entity right? If it is something that comes there, but then an entity is born, right? We call ourselves humans, but we still come from something else. Would that not be the same case for the AI? And of course, there's a multitude of people working for an AI, not just... Limitation of resources and programming, but... Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess by policies, yeah, but it's, I guess by policies, uh, I meant more... Um, sort of like policies on the impact of these systems on society today or something like that. But Maris uh, wants to ask something, go ahead. Nice to see you. Hello, Auli. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in an airport. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So about the policy, I was, uh, the question I was kind of thinking about was, 
are the us humans are we going to be able to get out of our own way with the AI? What I mean by that is uh, everything that AI currently is is human and all the problems along with it. So, you know, the racism, it comes from humans. It's not like AI has any opinions of its own of, uh, about race or anything. So how are we humans going to trans transcend that? Like something that is created by humans should take us to another level where we, for example, stop resisting healthy food that it's, it's a silly example, but for example, like super well-being, we would have to uh, accept, like give away our some of our power to the AI, allow it, for example, to tell us what to eat. And right now, humans are not doing it. Like they're not listening to doctors. <laughs> I mean, this is some this is something that's going to be very difficult because right now, all the policy that also in the in the European level, it's all based on fear. Like we are not about to give away any of our power. Like in Italy, chat GPT was blocked for a month because of privacy concerns. But this was only because of people's behavior, not because chat GPT was doing anything. So how are we going to get over that threshold, do you think? Mm. In that case, you know, it's not, as you were saying, it's not the technology's fault, it's the users who are using it. And so in this case, yeah. that's where these policy questions would come in. It's not even necessarily, what is the technology capable of? It's who are the people who have it in their hands and what are they gonna do about it, right? So in this case, if we, wanna, if we wanna try to transcend and do this, we need to collectively kind of come together and agree on how we want to use it, which has always been our biggest problem. How do we come together on this stuff, right? Democracy has showed us we like to disagree with one each other very much. And even in the case of, yeah, it's obviously so much better if I eat super healthy food every day, but I'm not going to do that because even in the case of super well-being, isn't it not in my well-being to eat something very delicious, even if it's a little bit bad for me, right? So there's always that kind of weighing of the options as well. So I think to your question of, you know, how are we going to transcend if we're always just going to be locked into our own humanistic problems? Well, I think that's kind of the bigger issue and point that transhumanism seems to ignore as well, yes that we're still stuck in the box, as you say, and we're not gonna get out of that box unless we figure out us first. You know, The technology is only going to, in some cases, keep us more locked into that box. Yeah, it might be more of the same thing. Yeah. You know, like uh, um, someone said, like we are overproducing. Mm -hmm. So maybe the AI is just more efficient in doing more of that. Yeah, over, <laughs> over efficiency and overproducing. There we go, perfect. Yes. It's going to be a little bit crazy, I would say, in that case. Yes. I'm a little bit pessimistic right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We always need that. Don't be sorry. <laughs> yeah, it kind of ties into this uh, eschatological discourse, basically, that, you know, the end of the world is coming. And so uh, some people are claiming that they are building AI to prevent that, such as some I think. And um, it seems that whatever we are doing actually is overproducing uh, on a much quicker play pace so like building AI is getting us closer to the end of the world much faster than otherwise we would because we also put a lot of resources on that actually so yeah so I see here there was a, a point made about and I remember actually uh, researching a good deal about this with AI being used to pass sentences against convicts and that it is biased against black people in the US. And you are arguing that it's not our fault, that's just the nature of AI. And yeah, it's being algorithmically thinking and using, you know, in, in nowhere in the algorithm is race even brought up for the AI as far as I understood. And yet it still, in the end, became biased against black people or was racist against them because of the other X, Y, and Z factors that seem to always correlate with those things. But I would argue, if you go beyond that, that those factors, those X, Y, and Z factors that it's reading and then is actually interpreting through is racism, is going to be the actual racism that created the distinction in the first place, that allowed the AI to pick up on those same factors and then process that algorithmically. So I see what you're saying. A race was never part of the equation for it, but it still became racist. 
but the reasons why it became racist, I would argue, were those pre-existing things that human racism created. I think there's also like this, um, the way they, so the basically the training data we use actually is not in any way, so you either have to actually unbias that consciously or it's pretty difficult, I suppose, to get like, um, what is this uh, representative data, especially mm -hmm. to scrape it off the internet and and it, it's not like it doesn't have, it doesn't really comply with any social scientific standards whatsoever, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in a lot of cases, um, engineers or scientists, they kind of disregard the fact that there are social scientific standards for presenting data in the first place. Um, But yeah, like Alex. sort of. You mean they, they separate themselves from that in a way that it's not the pure version of what they're perhaps trying to create through their it, systems. I I I actually suppose it's. I don't know. I mean, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt uh, a lot, so I try to avoid um, suspecting them of bad intentions, but I think in a lot of cases, actually, because like, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, I think is predominantly white male, right? Mm -hmm. So people are just not a aware of their own unconscious biases. And a lot of things that the systems become problematic in, they just don't perceive themselves like you know white people don't perceive racism actually until i don't know they are somehow closely linked to somebody who does you know and they they can perceive it by us so like if i have a black friend then then i can per perceive uh, racism actually through through them rather than i i just can't imagine it because i've never experienced it and it's it's uh, super difficult so you have to be like extra conscious Mm -hmm. And when people aren't, they just end up building things that sort of replicate whatever is the prevalent belief in society, which sadly is systemic racism, I suppose, depending on the society. But well, Europe is not clear from it either, because I've been reading a lot uh, recently about how, you know, the whole idea of European nation states is basically built on racism. So. Cool. No, I mean, yeah, I definitely agree with this sense of systemic yeah. racism in this way. Yeah, of course, if you are part of the hegemonic group in some sort of context, it, this just looks like another day to you because how else could you ontologically see it if it's just the same old? You have to try and push yourself out of that way in order to start trying to see it, right? And even then it's difficult. Another thing is that it has, uh, so I don't know if you know um, Langdon Winner's works, uh, but he was, he uh, wrote in the 70s about like, so how technology is perceived as um, sort of developing autonomously. So like technological determinism, basically. But he also, in one of his articles, he writes about um, how technology can create uh, you know, and it's still, I mean, it's always a result of human choices, but like it can end up creating um, settings that structure social interactions, but they become environmental in, in the way uh, how they are built. So, for example, he has this example of this architect or not, not architect, but urban planner who was responsible for most of New York architecture during like 1920 to, I think it was Robert Moses or somebody like that, uh, 2250s. And one of the things that he designed or had designed was the overpasses to Long Island. Yeah, yeah. So low that they can't uh, let buses go under, which effectively uh, cut off all the lower income families from this area and, I mean, and it has been attributed directly to his racism, which also was kind of the norm at the time. But what Langdon Winner sort of points out is that this kind of choice made by one person regarding in the building of some kind of technology 
has sort of emerged with the environment uh, in a way that we don't even question it anymore because it's just part of the natural reality and and like this is the way how somebody's choices somewhere can solidify uh you know the 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 reality or the perception the the experience for decades if not centuries to come and i think we are in 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 a lot of way we are building ai systems right now there is a lot of danger of that so so yeah like we we like to build those systems that, for example, judge about welfare or something, and then they end up, uh, of course, and of course, it's like, well, it's always the vulnerable groups who are, uh, who mostly suffer first, and because they suffer first, very often, I think, because of systemic racism, basically, the, the people, hegemonic groups, people in power, they are sort of like, it's very easy to dismiss it, because they don't feel that. Right, no, I greatly appreciate you bringing up this idea that technology is not only an artifact it, in many cases, but it is actually a part of the environment that cultivates our own understanding of things, which again was kind of the, the deeper thing of my talk as well, but you brought up these racist overpasses and it was actually a lot of my work deals with what's called uh, moralizing technology, which is how technology yeah, cultivates our moral understandings of things uh, I know the author of Averick, he uses the example of we created ultrasounds for fetuses and that we would think in, in while it does create very clear distinctions sometimes, such as not allowing buses in there. And so the beaches, I believe, is what they're going towards because the beaches became more prevalently white since they could afford the cars to get in there. But that it was that at least in that case, it was quite deterministic. But say in the case of fetuses or an ultrasound for a fetus, it was not quite as uh, deterministic in that, you know, on one case you say, hey, look, we're now able to, in a sense, separate the mother from the child because we have the image on there now. Uh, at the same time, we also have, oh, now we're actually able to see the child in there. And so there's the, the, the moralizing viewpoint. What is the moral being cultivated within, say, the expectant mother is actually very dependent. It's not as deterministic as we could foresee. So I think it's something that we definitely need to keep in mind is when we make technologies, when they become part of our material environment, they do cultivate a certain moral understanding and a certain, certain moral perspective that we have on things, but that we cannot, I, I don't think it's fair to say always that we can create one uh, like moralized attitude that it creates because there's so many other factors that can come into play. But in the case of say a racist highway, it's quite clear that that was to cut off intentionally or not. I didn't read up on that part, but it, buses could not go through. So lower income cannot get through there. But in the case of say a, a speed bump, right? And that's a lot of what perhaps these talks of policy are gonna be is their speed bumps, speed bumps, are the things that force us to have to drive slower. We don't like them, but they save lives. And it's a kind of technology that we've created that in the background of our minds, we are forced to behave a certain way if only for the benefit of everyone else. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of depth that we can go there with the, the, the moral attitudes cultivated by technology. Thank you for bringing it up again. in chat there are victoria's comments and and maurice uh do you maybe want to bring it up again also uh in in the video because we won't see the chat in youtube sure let, let me start with the first one there uh, from maurice but doesn't the stereotyping derive from the way the algorithm was created more than its nature per se and then uh, i i'm not sure if this is a reply to that or not, or if this is a reply, maybe something that I had said prior. Making generalizations is stereotyping. AI makes generalizations. It cannot predict anything meaningful about any about individuals. It can only stereotype. Hence, bias is inherent in the way machine computations work. If you supply AI with a data set that's 100% objective facts, it will develop generalizations about individuals based on what groups they fall into. Okay. 
Now you say that it's a, you know, 100% objective facts, but facts themselves, uh, I would say, have a, a spin to them, a, a certain observational thing. The fact that we plugged in that fact is a choosing that we decided to give it. Now it can read a bunch of different uh, possibilities, the data sets that it's been given, but the fact that, that it is a data node to begin with is a chosen desire in some way of something to be focused on, something to then that can be, as you say, generalized or stereotyped. I'm not sure I'd make generalizations and stereotypes the same. They're quite a big overlap in a Venn diagram, in my opinion, but I don't think they're the exact same circle in this way. But I would say that we supply the data sets with these facts, but that these facts are chosen and desired on and that they're focused on for a certain reason in one way or another. And that that's where the human bias still can come into and sort of change the way that the AI is using it. Since the AI is a mediator between our desired outputs, right? So what is the person? One could argue. Oh, yeah. Are you able oh, to speak oh, up oh. also? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, you want me to read these out? As you say, the, the chat can't be seen for the video recording. But I'm like calling, maybe Daria, do you want to oh, yeah. talk or you can't right now? Hello, guys. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can. Now you became silent, but. Okay, now is it going again? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So probably uh, like, thank you so much for presentation. A very interesting discussion. Like uh, I have to say that my toes did quarrel several times listening to you, but uh, it's normal that uh, we do not agree on um, points and have our own opinions. But uh, what I was thinking about AI as a decision-making tool or agency, which did sound sometimes in your conversation, um, is the difference between AI algorithmic processing and human decision-making process, which actually has very different things behind when AI is basically based on the logics and mathematics and it tries to give a sort of rational um, solution to the problems we give it to it. When in human decision-making, it is very, very important to consider sort of so say emotional component, which is rather relates to different types of hormones. And when you were talking about this um, bias and racism, there were actually like neuroscientific proofs that there is a different perception of the face in um, different races or between races. And um, uh, like uh, the fact of evaluation of uh, different <laughs> um, positions uh, when it's supposed to come to decision-making, uh, it is very different between rational decision making and uh, sort of say emotional decision making or emo uh, decision making of a live organism. That's why for me it's a bit um, complex when we try to call AI agency on its own or consider it uh, alive or things that it can be considered alive because to me it's missing still a lot to reach that point. And um, I rather see it as a tool when, um, uh, like I understand obviously the narratives behind of uh, uh, chat GPT, which I already did talk many times and uh, like all the other types of uh, narrativization, how AI help us to augment our, our personalities and uh, make better decisions. But I guess um, it is really, I'd say when it's related to the feathers recognition, as you told, like uh, very st strict and narrow tasks, it's, it is a tool. We're talking about a tool. And when we're talking about bigger problems, uh, when it's more uh, general uh, solutions and like, like generative AI, uh, it is definitely more designer behind, but still AI is a tool. So I don't know if you can um, 
uh, maybe give a bit of uh, more explanation to me. Maybe I missed something, but uh, I really see AI still as a tool. And uh, uh, I think uh, to become an agency on its own, it's really means that part of perception, which is not only uh, like perception based on the algorithmic processing, but what is uh, life organism has on its own. Thank you. Sorry if it's, I don't know, maybe. No, I just, I just want to clarify. So you're asking about the way that you're seeing is that AI is very much a tool and that tools lack the agency that perhaps I was perhaps alluding to in the presentation. I just want to be clear on the question. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So in this case, yeah, I, when I'm using the term agency, for a piece of technology or a tool or an artifact. What I mean by the agency is what it can offer me. It was designed with a certain purpose in mind and my material understanding, right? I understand my, my smartphone, it has agency and intentionality over me because I understand what this is capable of. We have created this with a common, relatively big common understanding of what this can possibly do for me. And so because of that, it is enacting a kind of agency over me. It is, in a sense, telling me, hey, I'm here and I can do X, Y, and Z. It just depends on what you want. And so in this case, that's why I'm saying that it is enacting a kind of agency over me. It is not the agency that perhaps we know and do, but that does not mean that we should disqualify its agency, because I think that is an important factor in the equation when it comes to our sense of being but also just the environment itself is that things are always enacting a kind of desired agency over us in some way or another okay thank you well it gives me a bit more clear idea but i guess we are like methodologically not meeting there but it is really interesting point of view maybe like i think for the business purposes like i mean when i was talking to a uh, director of ai research in google she told me uh, that uh, you know AI is there to assist uh, their users, but they don't really want to give their users total control on AI because uh, it may lead to manipulations and uh, all the other type of things. But indeed, it really depends on the tool we are talking about. So, yeah, well, I, I can um, apply what you are saying to some sort of AI, but def definitely, yes. Thank you a lot. Sure, no problem. Thank you for the question. I suppose it draws into like this new materialism uh, type of thinking, right? Uh, yeah. Or like this uh, actor network theory a bit and so on that sort of like gives uh, objects some sort of agency. Although uh, I've also read Al Hornborg's critique of that. So he's an anthropologist and, and he's really like uh, uh, also um, basically accuses new materialism of ignoring uh, all the ways that uh, global economic flows play into the making of these uh, machines or systems or objects, uh, which is actually another part of also like, so like for me, the AI ecosystem, like not just only the programmers and so on, but like there is a whole production chain that starts with, uh, you know, rare earth metals somewhere. For example, mm -hmm. and so on, and and all the all the problems that come with it, and so on, and then the data miners or or data labelers who get paid not that much, and and so on. So like all of all of this this huge 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 ecosystem that we actually don't really always know about, but in a sense, like I I get this objectivated uh, view of AI also because I suppose that uh, interest of a product developer is to develop something that is able to act on its own to an extent and, and solve uh, whatever uh, needs the customer should have. So uh, yeah, like so has and hence uh, chatbots or Siri, Alexa or whatever. So in this sense, they kind of like, yeah, they want to develop them into uh, the kinds of uh, products that so do have some kind of metaphorical agency. But, but still, 
I think the reality in a lot of cases, which also is not very much talked about, is that how much work it still goes into maintaining those products, even when they are online sometimes. So I don't, Alec was just, I think, bringing me an example of uh, what was the self delivery robots that still need to be, somebody needs to push a button so that they cross the street. And this ha has to happen a lifetime. So I think there's a lot of that also with chatbots and so on that that actually like the the goal of the chatbot is basically entertain the user until the user manages to get through to um, a real person, which is also the way sometimes users perceive it as they perceive it as a nuisance that prevents them from having uh, the actual a call with a human being and they have to navigate through this chatbot uh, to get to what they actually want which is to speak with a person and because we don't have too many uh, call center operators then again the company sort of like tries to um, diffuse uh, so much chatbot power out there that that they could I don't know locate then the human operators to I don't know the answers that they actually are relevant somehow or i don't know like prioritizing deprioritizing mm -hmm. yeah i mean you bring up this uh, i like that so i can see why we might have a little bit of a, a disagreement on that idea of agency because you're referring a lot to the background that is happening behind the technology itself whereas like what i'm referring to is like quite literally that like phenomenological experience happening between the user and the, the technology front, then, yeah. the very moment, right so yeah if we extend it out of course, there's so many more things that we can talk about and things change at that level, of course. And then, yeah, you bring up uh, like ChatGPT, but also the, the the call centers. Yeah, the, the chatbots there are just a way of, as you say, trying to figure out the prioritizing of the callers and all of that. At a certain point, we do just want to talk to the human, just mash zero and nine and you'll get the human operator, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, and then to, to kind of wrap back into what I was trying to talk about, like the environment, uh, mm -hmm. because, like um, an agency pretty much relies on the environment, whatever mm -hmm. that may be. Uh, so it's one of those things that like if if AI doesn't know what an environment is for that matter, uh, can it have its own agency at some point? You know, but the first thing is being able to to have the structure of environment. Um, yeah. So that that was kind of where that that question was heading. You know, because I, I could definitely hear how this the notion of agency was different. Um, but I, I definitely get what, what you mean by it, though. You get it now. Okay, that's good. Yeah. It's important that we define ourselves, right? Okay, so does anybody have any more ideas, questions, thoughts that you had while listening to share? Anyone else online? Or in the room with Alec? I don't know how many people you have there, but... He's, he's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, all right one question yeah not 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 as much a question uh hi thank you for the talk i think it was very enjoyable uh not as much a question i think um i was uh thinking of the your the diagrams that you put together initially about uh, the uh relationship ontological relationship of revealing and concealing and I was thinking of uh, the object as a Laconian uh, real and uh, the as an introspective process where the 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 me the the I that is mediating that is the relationship of the I with the me is mediated through technology. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, imagining that perhaps that this relationship of I being the the relationship of I and me being mediated is already uh, a relationship that is, intrinsic to AI systems because um, as as somebody as the conversation earlier we were already talking that um, we tend to think of AI as a single 
monolithic sort of object, but actually it's a complex system in itself. And um, in in a lot of a lot of the programming language that is used in at least rudimentary AI, yeah, I'm like uh, I can only speak for mid journey of the original stages of development. But basically, the the object language that was used was such that the it's made of components. The system is made of I'm trying to of like objects, and each object is not actually does not read the code of the other object. And essentially, each object has its own library. And uh, each object does not see the entirety of the, the thing in itself, the whole of the other object. So like if I if I program something to call on another object, then it simply calls a function. It doesn't uh, have access, so to speak, to the entire other object's entirety. So um, in my mind, the system, if AI is to be seen as a system, internally, it is already... Uh, there is this mutual uh, invisibility or mutual like mutual concealment in, in the sense that internally as well, um, there is that same sort of uh, concealment of the I and the me within this within an AI system. And uh, for me at least, it was it's already sort of a given that that AI can has a uh, has this relationship of the I and the me, and so. This conversation that we've ha been having of uh, of like the I and this, the subject and the object relationship, I think that's already a, a sort of dynamic at play in AI. So for me, the the conversation about just you know is AI a living being, a willing being, a being in it itself? I think that's apparent already, and it's just uh, yeah, yeah. That's, so that, that's just for, just a comment. No, 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 no. I think it's very interesting you say. So you're saying basically within an AI system itself, it is always going through this revealing and concealing nature within itself. And yeah. what is the functionality of that? Why is it set up in that way? Do you know? Uh, I think mostly it's easy. Like it's useful. It's easy to program that way because yeah. like libraries are just easy to put together. But, I figured uh, as much that that if yeah, it's yeah. if it output is always going for another output, that's just too much. Rather function to call it up. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Right. So I think I think this is like one space that uh, is worth sort of just like actually understanding the the real programming language that goes in the, the components in these systems and whatever we can know about these systems, uh, how they're constructed. I think that might uh, lead us to approach a more transcendental ontology not with the object but of the object yeah, uh, yeah. thank you no that was very interesting thank you for sharing no thank you yeah and there was a comment about you know to manage complexity might go back to communication uh if we go, if we would go back to alan k saying with re regard to encapsulation i'm not familiar with encapsulation Julian, would you like to explain uh can you hear me or about that? yeah yes we can quite softly uh, hi um thank you very much um so about what i've just heard i think uh, it it's perhaps uh, indeed connected to uh, the way how the complexity needs to be uh, tackled in the in the software industry and so perhaps what i just heard is it might be um yeah related to the fact that we cannot um have too much in our uh, mind when we do anything with software so we are uh, very much uh, uh, obliged to to deal with smaller chunks of uh, of ideas and concepts. And uh, Alan Kay uh, introduced um, object oriented programming, um, and uh, this is indeed related to the fact that we are modeling uh our ideas and uh, concepts in software development in software development with um uh objects so it it goes back to um 
dealing with complexity and uh, and eventually conveying ideas and uh, communicating better because uh, in the end we just want to be able to uh, yeah to to express ourselves um, with lines of code and and to have things which are understandable <laughs> so yeah it's it's interesting this reflection <laughs> it's like mirroring the the world <laughs> in a way and yeah, our that, capacity the software and us are kind of sharing a very common thread of self-communication in a way almost or even just yeah yeah, yeah perhaps <laughs> yeah <I> see it <laughs> Yeah, I've been actually thinking about the exact same thing is that how programming code is uh, either auto communication or communication between programmers like with each other because it's explicitly the if you think about the comments, for example, that you add to the code, they are explicitly for other people working with the same code or for yourself working with the same code later. So like this idea that that sort of the code should be speaking for itself. Uh, is especially weird in this context uh, when it becomes like a message directly from one programmer to another or to themselves yeah absolutely we are trying to to understand each other actually <laughs> um, and it's uh it's it's weird that we are using this medium like code because code is is uh, like a cipher and uh, we are using a cipher to understand each other better which is weird i mean doesn't make sense <laughs> well at the same time it's it made to make things happen with computers right absolutely yeah I, because in the end it's something. about sorry sorry no no that's a great that's a great idea and and like when it comes to <laughs> like i think every programmer at some point has had like a conversation about like what is a, a, a good code like a, the poetics of the code i suppose or like what is a well-written code that it's nice to read and and what is something that's just awful or like patched together so like this poetics of the code or the beauty of the code like exactly how you list those functions so it also becomes like a a function of actual actual language in a way or like a, yeah a, a encoded language yes absolutely i think uh it's um sometimes i i really wonder if we are trying to um i mean to 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 write code for doing things or I mean, to doing practical things which are useful or meaningful, or or we, if we are just trying to express ourselves in another in another way <laughs> than by speaking or writing, uh, and well, it's um, just uh, some thoughts. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, Thierry. Uh, Michael, do you want to comment also on your on your comment? Hello, can you hear me? You are very silent, but still no. Okay microphone right uh, michael do you think that you will get it oh, okay i figured it out yeah um, yeah no I, I was i was just bringing up the point because you were talking about comments that uh one reason that chat gpt is so good at uh certain types of reasoning or just, you know, if you want to call it reasoning in quotes um it's because the the base model for chat gpt includes both uh text and and code so the sort of um in the genealogy or yeah, the genealogy of chat gpt uh, there's a model called Codex model, which was which was uh, trained, you know, basically designed to, uh, you know, answer questions about programming, and and that's part of you know the everyday ChatGPT that everyone uses, even if they don't use it for 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 programming. But it is in, it is quite good at sort of uh, yeah generating you know simple Python code for simple tasks and things like that. Although if you push it hard enough, of course, it will start making things up as it does with everything else.
okay so basically it's yeah like that that it has in the in the source text basically it has the actual code and then it has the comment describing what this code should do yeah i mean it, it's a convention for programmers to do that but they've inadvertently made it uh, easier for these neural network models uh to um, recognize this uh, human written sort of yeah to be able to map between in some way uh in the sort of like you know find synonymous uh, natural language descriptions and uh, code uh, implementation. Thank you. And Nicola has uh, written a comment. Do you also want to uh, explain your train of thought or? Okay. And just to, to go off of Nicholas's comment, uh, you know, even then it's it's by no means it's it's no problem about you know not having the philosophical language to participate. Um because I you know your your message about um how the future will be will have large language models uh, that are personal programs or tuned by the individual. These agents can then be given further agency than as a chatbot uh, with goals and emo emotional set points that can vary behavior based on inputs in the environment. Um, reading that, it made me think of my job and customer support. Um, you know, because you know, you have a ticket coming in and you have a structure on what you're supposed to do in this situation. Um, in my opinion, you know, customer support, I think it's going to be obsolete within like the next five years, like as it, as it is today. Um, but I, I do see these customer support agents. I see them being in charge of, a some sort of AI agent, um, you know, so that the, the user contacts the company and then you kind of, you steer the AI to do the work, but really it still relies on like the, the final sins of the human, uh, making sure that all the, the data is correct and everything like that um, within the message. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do see them becoming more um, internal systems, especially for corporations too. Um, but so even then that's, that's kind of interesting where we haven't as the technology, you know, for for AI, it hasn't really made that that separation truly into its own like large systems. Yeah, that, that was just my my comment towards this comment. Thank you. Anyway, um, I don't know. We are nearing the end of end of the session, I suppose. So, any last ideas, thoughts, anything? I can see that there is probably a discussion uh, it, behind you, Alec. Also, <laughs> do you want to share that part? No, it's just discussion about you know life. <laughs> Uh, Jared, your mic is muted. Yeah. So that's what this whole thing has been about. Why are you guys hiding? <laughs> yeah, from over here, we don't have any other questions um, at the Guildy House. I think we've had like great, great discussion, great, very insightful comments. I just want to thank everybody who, who took the time to write uh, and and comment, and share their thoughts. Uh, but like Jared, do you have sort of like last, last ideas no, I, that you want to share? I was just going to say the exact same thing as you, since this is dealing. This is a very specific aspect of the grander research that I'm going to be doing for PhD. I want to say I appreciate everyone's comments 
especially those that were critical of what I was saying, because that's going to give me obviously a lot of things to then go forward with and always consider, right? So I greatly appreciate everyone that uh, you know, kind of uh, gave me something to think about, but also wanted to engage and especially for your time to listen to what I had to say. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you're able to present about the, the research and I definitely look forward to, to reading the articles. Um, you know, once you get, once you get the program going. So yeah, you'll have to keep us posted. Oh, definitely, for sure. And then just so everyone knows, the next presentation will be on June 19th. Um, and it'll be the fourth seminar, and we will discuss human machine interactions through the concept of languaging as an embodied process. And the presenter is Marie Terris. Um, and she <laughs> yes, and then she, yeah, the title is Why We Do Not Communicate with Machines. Rethinking language and speech enabled AI from the languaging perspective. Yeah, the abstract is up on the website, so so you can go check it out. And uh, I will upload this recording to YouTube as soon as I can. And the previous sessions are there too. And thank you everyone for participating. And thank you, Jared, especially for sharing your Thank you for providing me the stage for it. <laughs> okay, so looking forward to seeing you all next time. Yes, see you then. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you.